Good morning everyone, I'm Renata Skimmer. Welcome to this morning's We Read For You by USB Ed in collaboration with Finweek. The book I'm going to discuss today is Grounded by Bob Prozen. Grounded is about how leaders stay rooted in an uncertain world and we're going to explore what it means to be a healthy leader. We're going specifically to look at the six healthy roots of leadership in terms of physical health, emotional health, intellectual health, vocational health, social health and spiritual wealth. Enjoy. So Grounded is a book that was written by Bob Rosen and if I can tell you a little bit about the author, he's a clinical psychologist. He's currently employed at the University of Washington at the medical faculty there, medical and behavioral sciences. And he did a lot of research in terms of leadership and what makes people as leaders really outperform others. What he said is that there's something about leadership that we need these days to survive in the world that was not there 20 years ago. And part of it is how the world has changed, where there's more complexity, there's more speed of change, people want more transparency in the world, there's more complexity. What he argues is then that leaders at every level can be more self-aware, develop their untapped potential and drive significant better results for themselves and their teams and organizations. So this whole approach of healthy leadership is a personalized approach. If you take care of yourself, you can take care of your team, you can take care of your organization. So what do we know? We know that we are faced with six big forces at this stage in the world. And it's the speed, uncertainty, complexity, cynicism, competition and globalization. People think that their efficacy as a leader depends only on their results and only on the task results. They forget it also depends on the sustainability and their people development. So there's six aspects to his model and I just like the summary. It's if you're physically healthy, you can deal with the speed of change. If you're emotional healthy, you can deal with uncertainty. Intellectual health give you the skills to address complexity. Social health the transparency and trust in the world. Vocational health is the huge global competition. And then spiritual health is basically what we would call CSR, or really your sustainable leadership practices in the bigger world. So if we link that six forces that we confronted with, with what we can do then to counter the effect or to make it more sustainable. So the first aspect or the first route is then physical health, which consists of body-mind awareness, energy management and a peak performance lifestyle. So what happens if we do not take care of our physical health? We lack energy and stamina, more stress and unhappiness, work um, illness, work loss due to illness, etc. So symptoms of burnout, if you look at this, but the physical manifestations of it. So your health depends on a few things. There's the genetic makeup, there's your personal history, there's your experiences, but also your beliefs and expectations about what you are capable of doing and performing. The second aspect of physical health is then energy management. In terms of where do you feed from, where do you get your energy from, but also how do you give energy and inspiration to the people you work with. So staying physically healthy and fit reduce medical complications and illnesses with up to 75%. So it's an inward and the outward process. It's about how you take care of yourself, harnessing personal energy, generating organizational energy, and using interactions. So it's again the relationship aspect that come out here as well. Bottom line is unhealthy executives produce unhealthy companies. Unhealthy companies produce unhealthy employees. Unhealthy employees are unhappy employees. If we move on to emotional health. Emotional health is about self-awareness, positive emotions and resilience. This lady, Nomi Bergman, was currently, it's, she's the CEO of Charter Communications. Originally it was a family business and she took over the business from her father. And she discovered in her journey, luckily we don't all have to discover, we can sometimes just learn from other people, that EQ and SQ is incredibly important in terms of being a successful leader. We know more or less that if you look at task intelligence or the old IQ concept and you have task proficiency in terms of how skilled and practiced you are and you look at EQ, SQ, EQ, SQ is double as important as the other two to predict how successful you will be as a leader. 
Now, when Naomi took over from her father, her father's motto was, you don't have to be liked, you just have to be respected. But she realized if this was the principle that she lived with in her company, she was frustrated, unhappy, there was a um, huge turnover of the workforce, people left, and then she decided, but you know, the bottom line is, I'm not true to myself, I'm not true to my own values, and it is about emotional intelligence, and it is about social intelligence. And she now lives with a motto of being a kind person. It's more about bringing up your ideas in a way that protect the ego of other people. The nice thing is if we look at it from a science perspective, our brains are hardwired to be compassionate, to trust, to have empathy. And I'm always amazed by people saying, yeah, someone has to earn your trust. Why must people earn trust? Who? I mean, none of us enter a relationship with the idea of let's try to disappoint the other people. We should give trust away. If we look at intellectual health, now what we said, intellectual health gives us the ability to cope with the complexity of the world and this data overload that we get. It's about deep curiosity, having an adaptive mindset and then paradoxical thinking. Now what is important in terms of the intellectual health, if we first look at deep curiosity, the case study then that he discusses of Mike Peters of Huntington Ingalls industry, it's the biggest shipbuilding industry in the world. He was fired more than once from previous jobs until he realized that the big thing that is lacking for him is a full understanding of the business. And what he does is what, like what we sometimes have programs of CEO for a day, they have the opposite. He really went and worked in every single little aspect of their shipbuilding plant, whatever you call it, to really understand the industry. And he then says it takes an entire company of curious people to build a great business. It's interesting in a recent study by IBM in 2012, they asked which is the one leadership quality that is most important for you um, as a successful leader? What is the one thing that you look for? And everyone answered creativity. So a strong adaptive mindset has the ability to hold two things in mind at the same time. A, the world is uncertain but B, I can create my own stability. So if I'm grounded, I can have an internal locus of control. Doesn't matter what happens in my environment, I can create some stability for myself. But Jorgen Ficknudstorp, he's um, CEO of the LIGO group at the moment, and LIGO means play well. It helped for hours and hours of entertainment when I was younger. He said that the important thing as a leader is to be able to keep this paradoxes in mind. And some of the things that he said always is, I need to take charge and let go. So this is what we need to do. And then he stand back and he let his employees be creative and do it for him. Realistic optimism in terms of I must hope for the best, but I must be realistic. I mustn't be, it mustn't be positive thinking, it must be realistic thinking. So if you examine the different concepts or the different ideas, just ground it in reality of what is possible. Confident humility, I need to be confident, but I mustn't be arrogant. I must just still be, um, have, be humble, have humility in terms of that other people might have a better answer than I do. Committed attachment, committed attachment means I am absolutely committed for the objectives or for the goal or for the change management plan, but I need to be able to be detached enough not to be emotionally too involved so that I can still have a bird's eye view. If you become emotionally too involved, you will lose that perspective. Social health is really about nourishing teams. It's about authenticity, mutually rewarding relationships and nourishing teams and communities. Being authentic and being just very straight and rude is two different things. Authentic still means you take the best interest of other people at heart, not only yourself. And authenticity cannot be authentic if it's self selfish. Okay, that's important. So mutually rewarding relationships, even in a competitive environment, there's four pillars, empathy, fairness, communication, and appreciation. And that's valid for all relationships, whether it's personal, interpersonal, or in our organizations. So nourishing teams is about being able to cope with modern teams as well. Modern teams are virtual, they're flexible, there's not fixed roles, they can mold and merge like a mover. Vocational health then is something that Steve Jobs was very good at. Always when Steve Jobs is used as an example of a leader, I cringe because um, he sees 
EQ, SQ was not what I considered being a good leader. Okay, but his vocational health was excellent and he was extremely clever. So vocational health is about having a meaningful calling, personal mastery and a drive to succeed. Personal mastery, we all have the need to, to improve ourselves. It's that innate desire for growth and self-improvement. What he said is anything you're going to try, you need to study, you need to be prepared. Lifelong learning. Now, once again, our brain is absolutely wired for that. Companies whose leaders are dedicated to learning and teaching perform better with better outcomes. 27% more productive, 40% more revenue and 50% greater net growth. The last one is then spiritual health, which is about higher purpose, a global connectedness and generosity of spirit. And that is the three pillars then also of CSR in a company. It's about meaningful benefits, about how they care really about the best interests of the society and not only about the organization. If you have a value-based brand, you outperform over a 10-year period. Generosity of spirit is the last one. It's from David Rubenstein of the Carlisle Group that was used an example as really someone generous of spirit. He said, I don't want to spend my life being the richest guy in the cemetery. But what he said, it's not about giving your money in terms of CSR. It's about giving your time, giving your commitment and giving your energy and your ideas. That's way more valuable than just giving the money. Okay. The last part of the book is just putting this into action. So I developed this six times three roots. So there's six big roots and under them is the, the three sub roots, what we've quickly discussed in the 18 chapters. He then pulls it together in terms of how do I apply this? How do I become then a healthy leader? Bottom line is challenge yourself by developing each of these roots, all 18 of them, six times three. Use them to see, to think, to feel, and to act and really reflect and make time for reflection on this route and see where is the gaps and the needs at the moment. As what you have to do is then tap into a higher purpose, forge a shared direction, foster productive relationships, unleash human energy, seize new opportunities and drive high performance. And how you would perform then is greater market reputation, outstanding shareholder value, profitable growth, renowned talent magnet, and positive social impact, so the triple bottom line. So that's how I put it from who you are, what you have to do, and how you then perform. Tap into a higher purpose. Once again, people are more motivated by deep personal values than by external rewards. We've touched on that already. Acknowledge the current reality, but always have a better plan for the future. That is a shared direction. It's about unleashing human potential appreciate and recognize people it is so so important not necessarily in terms of monetary rewards teach and mentor protect and stretch but really get the right people and developing them fostering productive relationships um, we are not investing enough in really creating these traditions and inspiring our employees to also give back we think as a company we give back the money but that's not what it is about it's really doing this Seizing new opportunities, um, never act out of fear. That's linking back to Fufuzeri, the guy from the New York Fire Department that said, um, respond, don't react. He said the same strong concept, but, but do not react, rather be prepared. And then the last thing is to drive high performance that he summarized in the book Rosen then as better and con more consistent customer server, less problems and defects, greater willingness to address problems and then higher performance in each person. So conclusion of the book then, if we look at why we should be a healthy leader, how can a healthy leader create a healthy organization and a healthy workforce and why this is so important for us in terms of sustainable leadership is to weather that six forces that we mentioned right in the beginning. So leadership is contagious. Every healthy leader inspires another healthy leader or inspires others to become healthy as well. And then we can truly transform the world one leader at a time through being healthy and balanced. Okay, that's it. Questions?